bit like an earthquake, actually. Brexit continues to produce aftershocks in the UK, which, as we know, voted to leave the EU in a referendum. And in order to begin the process, Britain has to trigger Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. But the High Court has ruled that MPs must approve the triggering and the government appealed that ruling to the Supreme Court. In other words, the High Court has asserted the sovereignty of Parliament. And now, one of those 11 Supreme Court judges, the Deputy President of the Supreme Court, Lady Hale, has said the government might have to replace the 1972 Act, which took the UK into Europe in the first place. And she said the referendum was not legally binding on Parliament. This is talking to some students in Malaysia, I think. Leave campaigners are outraged, and the Daily Mail has described the High Court judges as the enemies of the people. Fade up the miserable theme, I think. Professor Campbell McLaughlin teaches international law at Victoria University and is the author of a book, Foreign Relations Law, and he's here to explain what this is all about. Hello. Morning, Kim. What's, what's the latest headlines in the UK is... Fresh blow for Theresa May, Prime Minister, as Supreme Court rules Scotland and Wales can intervene in Article 50 triggering. How will that affect the Supreme Court case? Well, the uh, Supreme Court, which is after all the Supreme Court for the whole of the United Kingdom and which has Scottish and Northern Irish judges on it, uh, as well as uh, English and Welsh judges, uh, has quite liberal powers to permit other parties to intervene in cases of real constitutional significance. And the issue here is to what extent might withdrawal from the union affect uh, the powers of the devolved governments in Scotland and Northern Ireland in particular, where, of course, a majority of the population voted against Brexit. Right. Northern Ireland, um, there was a parallel case to this in Northern Ireland. The applicants lost, right? Yeah. The what applicants, happened? The applicants lost in Northern Ireland. The, the argument they ran there was that Brexit uh, uh, needed uh, to be referred to the Northern Irish Parliament because of the potential effect on the Good Friday Agreement. The idea behind this being that the Good Friday Agreement presumes that both the Republic and the province of Northern Ireland are part of the Union. You can have freedom of movement between the two of them and European institutions will underpin the working of the agreement. They lost... uh, The central question which arose in the English proceedings, which is to what extent is the power of Parliament to make the law of the land likely to be undermined by a decision to withdraw, wasn't put so squarely in issue uh, in the Northern Irish proceedings. In any event, uh, just this morning, uh, the Northern Irish uh, proceedings have been joined uh, so that the Supreme Court will have to deal with them as well. All right. So when the High Court ruled that MPs must approve the triggering, that essentially was saying Parliament reigns, right? Yeah, it was underpinning the most fundamental rule of the British Constitution and of ours, actually, which is that only Parliament, not the executive, gets to decide what is the law of the land. And, of course, that's really important. It's important for us as well as for the people of the United Kingdom um, because that's what underpins uh, our democratic system and our our freedoms. And, in fact, New Zealand's been quoted in the case law on that, hasn't it? It has. One of the few cases where the idea that the executive could suspend the operation of an act of parliament... Uh, has ever been litigated was a uh, famous case, famous in New Zealand and now famous globally, called Fitzgerald and Muldoon, brought by a local Wellingtonian, uh, Mr Fitzgerald, at the time when Muldoon was elected, when he had announced by a press release that he was going to suspend the operation of the Superannuation Act pending uh, the introduction of new legislation. Mr Fitzgerald very public-spiritedly said, no, uh, you have no power to do that, and the Chief Justice of the day, uh, Sir Richard Wilde, uh, agreed. And, in fact, the, the, this is being in the argument that the court put up um, in the UK. It was specifically referred to, this case, wasn't it? Absolutely, because the rule about this, which was established at the time of the Glorious Revolution in 1688 right. and the Bill of Rights, which, incidentally, is as much a part of New Zealand law as it is a part of, as, as it is a part of UK law, 
is so basic that almost nobody has ever sought to challenge it. Um, and uh, Muldoon did, uh, but he failed. And thus, uh, this is an important precedent for what the uh, English court had to decide. And no person or body is recognised by the law of England as having a right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. Absolutely. And it goes further than that because Parliament also has the power to control what is the law of the land. And of course, that's the issue in the UK proceedings, because the huge raft of law we're talking about, the huge raft of rights we're talking about, weren't actually uh, bits of parliamentary legislation. They are EU direct rights, which by the European Communities Act that you mentioned in your introduction, Kim, are given the force of law in the UK. Um, This referendum Hmm. was not binding, right? Parliament in the UK asked the people a question. Yes. Do you wish to leave the union or don't you? And they said, we want to leave. And by majority, they said, we want to leave. They gave an answer to Parliament. It's now for Parliament to take up that answer and work out when and how that is to be achieved. And of course, those are are very big questions. Are you saying it wasn't binding or it was binding? Well, the referendum as such has no legal force. Right. uh, But I'm not to be taken as in any way undercutting its significance. The people have spoken. It's now for their elective representatives to work out what the effect of that uh, is and how to implement it. If it were to be put to Parliament, and Parliament, because uh, a majority of parliamentarians in Britain are anti-Brexit... If they said, no, we don't want to leave, what would happen then? Well, uh, I'm... Are you saying there's some kind of gentleman's agreement that they will give effect to the voice of the people? I think if that were to happen, that would provoke a constitutional crisis. At the moment, I don't sense that that is in any way likely, and I think press suggestions to the contrary are quite mischievous. The 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 point here is that Parliament has to be engaged in deciding when and how uh, Brexit is to happen because the rights of millions of ordinary people in the UK are being taken away by the result of this decision. You know, the right of freedom of movement and freedom of establishment, which at the moment everybody in Britain who's a British or European citizen enjoys, is an absolutely basic right. And if Parliament isn't to have the uh, power to determine when and how that right is affected, uh, then uh, one of the core uh, provisions of parliamentary sovereignty would be undercut. You mean it's a basic right according to the 1972 legislation? Or It's, it's a basic right anyway? It's a basic right because the 1972 legislation says all rights in the of EU law that have direct effect in the UK are to be given effect as part of our law. Right. I mean, it's not a basic human right as such, is it? It's, it's currently a legal right. Yes, but the reason why I call it a basic right is that these are rights which are given by the original founding treaties of the European Union to all people in uh, the European Union, including those in Britain. All right. Um, I mentioned the Daily Mail suggesting that... <laughs> um, sorry to laugh, but they're so, they're so firm, aren't they, the Daily Mail? Uh, the judges, the High Court judges, are the enemies of the people. Um, you would dispute that, presumably. But you can understand how the Daily Mail might see that. Here's well, the people. The people have voted, and the High Court is saying, no, no, hang on, it's not that simple. What the court was doing was upholding the rights of the people and not trying to subvert them. The proposition that the executive of the day can simply take a general political referendum uh, decision of of the people and then uh, deciding for itself how to implement it would be to fundamentally undercut the rights of the people. By executive, you mean the government, essentially? Yes, absolutely. Um, The Observer wrote an editorial about the High Court ruling on Brexit and it, and it had this great paragraph talking about, you know, fundamental principles of British democracy, that Parliament is sovereign and so on and so forth. And it says, castigating the judges and by extension, anyone who has the effrontery to agree with them is exactly what the hard Tory Brexiters and their accomplices and the lie factories of Fleet Street have resorted to with a venom, vindictiveness and vituperation remarkable even by their standards. The will of the people has been thwarted by an act 
activist judiciary, these bewigged closet remainders, members of the fabled, well-heeled liberal metropolitan elite are enemies of the people, they shriek. Some of these sleaze peddlers even dipped into homophobia, highlighting the sexual orientation of one of the judges. Inexcusable! I love that. <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful? And it goes to, on and on. Wouldn't it be wonderful, Kim, to get to be a journalist and not just to have to be a lawyer uh, like me and, and uh, to express things in more measured tones? Yes. But the point here is that the very core principles that those that argued to leave the union... Uh, were arguing for were the restoration of the British Constitution. Mm -hmm. And last time I saw the fundamental principles of the British Constitution were parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law. And that's exactly what the judges are upholding. Incidentally, one of the three judges who signed the unanimous judgment of the, of the High Court in England uh, spent much of his career acting as counsel for the government. He was Treasury Devil, Lord Justice Sales. So the idea that, that uh, the judges have some kind of political predisposition against Brexit is is plainly uh, not the case. So if this is so self-evident, based on case law, based on the sovereignty of Parliament, yeah. blah, 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 why is the government appealing to the Supreme Court in the UK? Well, I'm not going to speculate on the government's motivations. I think we have to accept that the issue that's being presented here is unprecedented. This is probably the most important constitutional law case to have written and arisen in the UK in recent years. Uh, and uh, Has there been no precedent, nothing like this before at all? Uh, uh, there have been plenty of cases which have tested and, I would say, upheld the principle which the Divisional Court um, argues for. But uh, it's very unusual in the UK for the courts to get drawn into uh, a, um, a battle between the government of the day and Parliament. The reason why they've done so here is courts don't get to choose the cases that are brought before them. The parties do that. Both, ah. both sides accepted in this case, Kim, that the court had jurisdiction to determine the issue. Mm. Uh, and um, having had the issue presented, they've got to give an answer uh, according to the law. Right. I think the, the, uh, the government's decision to appeal uh, will ensure at least that the highest court in the land gives a definitive answer one way or the other. And are you saying that the government went to the Supreme Court for point of clarification? I think it would be difficult to proceed, would have been difficult for them to proceed without that degree of certainty about what their position was. Right. Who took this high court challenge and why? Well, um... I don't know much of the details of uh, the plaintiff, Mrs Miller, beyond uh, what you or I could read in the press, uh, Kim. Uh, to read the press, uh, she's indicated that she felt there was an important point of principle here that should be, uh, should be determined to the courts. So in, in other, other words, words, she's doing it out of public spiritedness yeah. in the same way... That Anybody Mr. could do it. That's right, and but in the same way that Mr Fitzgerald uh, did uh, when he took Fitzgerald and Muldoon. I think he had a minimal financial uh, stake in the superannuation uh, scheme, uh, but he wanted to have the principle established. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, the anybody could do it. Yeah. I mean, you can take the whole government to court and hold up a, the Brexit and... Well, but that, again, is a fundamentally important right, that access of the citizens to the courts to have these issues determined uh, is the other great thing, along with parliamentary sovereignty, that makes our unwritten constitutional system another thing that we share with the UK, unusually amongst the world's great democracies, uh, uh, so important. I mentioned Lady Hale, who has said that, the, you know, the, the um, and she was talking to students, I think, but she is the vice deputy president of the Supreme Court, and she said the government might have to replace the 1972 Act, holus bolus, and the referendum wasn't legally binding on Parliament, so on and so forth. It's been suggested that she's pro-European, um, pro-EU, and she overstepped her position in making that comment outside the courtroom. What is your view of that? Well, um, I've read uh, Lady Hale's speech, I think it was at the Commonwealth Law Conference, actually, in Malaysia. Uh, and, um, you know, she'd been invited there, no doubt, many months, even years before, to give a speech about the basic principles of the UK Constitution. It would pre be pretty hard to give a speech like that and not make no mention of the most important case to come to the Supreme Court on the issue. 
I've read the uh, speech notes which are up on the web. Seems to me what she was doing was simply laying out the issues which the court will have to decide. Uh, and it's really only press hysteria which is suggesting that uh, she's got any predisposition uh, one way or the other. Is this about the fact of leaving or is it more about the terms of the exit? It's more about the terms of the exit and the terms of the exit are so important uh, and it's not enough just to say, well, that's all for uh, subsequent negotiation with uh, the European Council uh, because this is, the, it takes two to tango and uh, working But there out, is no tango. The, there will be a tango. Will there be a tango? <laughs> yes, there will, Kim, because the uh, the current British government is committed to uh, following through on the decision of the British people. But how it does it is something with which Parliament must vitally be involved. And it's not enough just to say, oh, well, we press the button and we wait and see what happens in the negotiation process, because... The basic parameters of how that negotiation process is to work. But what's to negotiate? Everything is to negotiate. The whole ter with Europe, uh, the whole terms upon which Britain will continue to deal with Europe, including some of those fundamental rights like freedom of movement and establishment, are all up for negotiation. But internally, uh, as we discussed at the beginning of the interview. Um, uh, th there's also the question of the effect of this on the internal constitutional arrangements of Britain and with its devolved assemblies. Right. And are things like defence, are they going to be in terms of the exit? Um, you know, continued defence cooperation and uh, know, foreign policy, I don't know. So... Uh, under, under the current terms of the uh, EU treaty arrangements, uh, most of the, uh, as it were, core defence and foreign policy functions remain with the member states. They, they haven't been transferred to the Union. There's a possibility by agreement for the Union to take common policies. So the short answer to your question is no, those sort of issues won't uh, be at the forefront, as I understand it. What will be at the forefront uh, are um, all of the myriad of economic arrangements between Britain and, and the Union and the way in which those affect the lives of ordinary people. You know uh, about this because you practised in, in, in London um, until uh, early this century, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> that dates us, Kim. If you'd, 2003, I think, you yeah. came back to New Zealand. If you'd stayed in London, yeah. would you have been involved in this case? Uh, who knows? Uh, Given your areas of expertise. Well, um, I, I guess I continue to have uh, a foot in both camps. I've I've still got an associate membership of, of London Chambers and I take a very close interest in what goes on there as well as uh, here. Um, but, of course, um, one of the great things, one thing I'm clear about is that I would have never have had the chance to write my book um, on foreign relations law if I hadn't come back and uh, become a professor. I would have been too busy. Right. Um, if the uh, Supreme Court then decides it has a choice, right? It decides yeah. one thing or the other. Yeah. There's no nuances. Well, uh, it will have to answer the question that is put to it. Um, you're right. Uh, but it will do so with, with reasons. And so within the scope of that, there may be uh, some room uh, for the way in which it describes what the scope of uh, what has to be done is. But essentially, you're right, Kim. It'll have to answer the question. And so what... What are the alternative future tracks, in your view? Well, I, I'm speculating. If 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 the uh, if Mrs. Miller was to be unsuccessful uh, in the Supreme Court, then uh, it would be for the executive solely to decide when to trigger Article Fifty. The executive, the government of the day, and Britain, that'll be according to Theresa May. That'll start in March. Correct. Right. Um, the executive knows that they will still have to consult with Parliament uh, at, at some stage um, because the European Communities Act is still in force. That's the act that gives all these rights direct effect in, in the UK. Uh, and in any event, once they've done a deal with Europe, assuming they're able to do one, and that the two-year period provided under Article 50 doesn't just elapse and the UK has to leave anyway, if they've done a deal... 
they have to come back to Parliament anyway because uh, another recent act in the UK, the 2010 Constitutional Law Act, says all treaties have to be laid before Parliament for, and Parliament has the right of veto. So at some stage they have to go back to Parliament. What this case is about is when Parliament gets involved and whether or not it must be involved at the outset of that process, which the, the effect of the Divisional Court's judgment is it must. It seems ferociously complicated. No, it's not ferociously... <laughs> the, Easy for you to say. The process of withdrawal is ferociously complicated. Yes. Ferociously complicated. In fact, uh, one of the key players uh, described it as the most complicated legal project that the UK's ever had to undertake outside wartime. Uh, but the principles underlying this are not complicated, and it's very important that we be very clear about them and not uh, fuzz them up, because if we don't in an unwritten constitution, stand up for parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law at a time when they are being brought into question, then we'll, what we'll lose will be, would be much greater than uh, 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 simply the narrow question of the uh, effect of the community, European Communities Act uh, on uh, European rights. Right. Let us not fuzz them up then. <laughs> what shape will the Supreme Court appeal take then? What's actually going to happen? Well... All we know so far is that the court set aside uh, four days of hearing starting, I think, on the 5th of December. Mm -hmm. uh, so the parties are all beavering away at the moment, finalising their written arguments. Uh, the court will then have to set a timetable to hear both uh, the appellants, in this case the government, and uh, Mrs Miller in reply. And then also, as you pointed out, to hear all those other parties that are intervening in the proceedings. Um, and you, you, incidentally, you can watch all of this on live stream from the UK Supreme Court. It's fantastic viewing. Um, and this is not just for this case. This is this always happens with the Supreme Court in the UK. Yeah? This always happens, and I think it's a terrific uh, thing. It makes the court accessible to everyone. Um, then the judges. It'd be like watching paint dry most of the time, though, wouldn't it? Well, I suppose it depends how you get your kicks, uh, Kim, but yes. I have to say I found it absolutely fascinating and it's incredibly um, compressed. You know, four days is actually a really short time is it? to hear argument on a case of this Can kind. Can people just tune in for the final quarter? As it were? <laughs> hey? They could yeah. if they wanted to. Right. And you don't have to get up at four in the morning either because you can watch it after the event. Uh. So the judges will then uh, go away. No doubt they'll all go away to their homes over Christmas and think about all of this. They'll be under, I imagine, considerable pressure to produce a judgment early in the new year. And uh, the um, 11 judges, all 11, are oh. sitting on this. Yeah. This is unusual, possibly the first time? So far as I've been able to discover, it's the first time that the whole uh, uh, bench of 11 judges have sat. Normally the Supreme Court, like the Judicial Committee of the uh, House of Lords before it, sat with five. There's plenty of precedent for enlarge, an enlarged bench of um, seven or nine in important constitutional cases. I imagine the reason why the decision that has been taken here to have all 11 is so that there can be no question that the selection of particular judges for the panel could have any effect on the outcome. But, of course, the practicalities of getting uh, uh, a, um, a result from 11 very independently-minded and brilliant jurists uh, will be considerable. Have you, have you... Why do we care about it in New Zealand, given that, as we've spoken about, the Fitzgerald versus Muldoon case sorted that here? We care about it in New Zealand because actually the principles that are involved here are just as much a part of our unwritten constitution as they are part of the British uh, unwritten constitution. So uh, although the particular application of it to EU rights is not something that uh, has any direct parallels here, the underlying idea that the government of the day cannot, by executive fiat, suspend the law of the land is really important to us. Uh, and uh, so we should feel passionate about uh, this, uh, this principle here. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, we'll watch that case with interest. Thanks so much. We love your show, Kim. Thank you. We, is that the royal we? Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Actually, Campbell McLaughlin's wife, I need to declare an interest, has been on this programme because she is 
Rona Fraser, who organises operas in your very garden, is she not? And she's planning two for February of next year, undaunted by the events of this week. What are they, We live in a wonderful, vibrant city. What are they, those operas? She's going to do Handel's Theodora and, very excitingly, Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin. Oh, oh, Eugene Onegin. Yeah. Um, I meant to ask you then... Given your interest in law and government, do you have any views on whether it's folly to continue to have the central government in Wellington? Uh, Vibrant, perhaps a little too vibrant. No. Some of the world's most exciting uh, and innovative cities uh, happen to sit on fault lines, and Wellington is no exception. All righty-ho. Campbell McLaughlin. Cheers.